The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is Thomas Goss, back with you once again for the third and final look at Mars, Bringer of War. We left off just before this huge tutti octave unison passage. So let's look at these three bars and we'll have to break this apart group by group, section by section, rather than just saying, well, this line is played by the flutes and the first violins, and this line is played by the oboes and the first and third trumpet and so on and so forth. It's just easier to try to grasp these things by looking at instrumental groups, which is pretty much how you would do it if you were conducting this. So the first thing to notice is the strings. I would say try to default looking at the strings a lot of the time when you are score reading, because generally speaking, that is where the strength of a lot of scoring is, where the heart of a lot of scoring is. In this case, there is simply a need for the strings to cover as much territory as possible throughout the entire orchestra to keep the sound of this passage being orchestral, that is, with the feeling of strings, as opposed to more of like a concert band sound or wind band sound. So here it's pretty obvious what's happening. We're returning to those Gs from the very first bar, which were played originally, if you'll remember, Col Leno. Now here, of course, the strings are just hammering away, marcato at uh, triple F, with the first violins on top, and then G on top of the staff in the seconds. Then, this is interesting, G octaves with the violas, which is a very easy double stop to play this bottom note here, this bottom G, is just going to be the G string of the viola, and the top G will be fingered on the D string. The same thing is happening here in the cellos, exactly. Open G on the bottom, and fingered G on the D string above. And then the double basses just hammer away at their bottom G. So that's all simply taken care of. Now let's jump up to the winds. The very highest note here are the piccolos, a2, and I find that instead of making things harsher, I find that a2 piccolos up in the most brilliant part of the range has a tendency to sort of moderate the sound rather than making it very, very penetrating and ear splitting. If you put two piccolos up there, it can control it somewhat, just it's somehow the sound gets mixed a little bit, a little homogenized, so that it's not just as pointy, like stabbing you in the ear as much. Of course, if you're sitting right next to them, that's a different story. But with the psychoacoustics of it, I feel that it's just a little easier to manage, so that A2 up there is not quite as over the top and blasting as you might think, this is my philosophy. <laughs> Okay, now the flutes are doubling the top line of the strings, then oboes below that, a2 plus the first clarinet. I love this triple octave here in the clarinets. The next pitch down, English horn covering that same middle note as the second clarinet, and the bass oboe covering the same note as the third clarinet. So aside from the a2 of the oboes, it's really, really well balanced. In fact, I would say it is balanced even with this A2 here because oboes tend to be a little weaker in general in these massive, massive 2T kinds of passages. Then the bottom note here is actually the same note as this A here, the space clarinet A, which is of course sounding G, the same G as this bass oboe note which transposes down an octave, right? Then, of course, we have A3 bassoons in the bottom, and interestingly enough, the contra bassoon just plays a single note and then leaves off. It's really not needed at all. 
and can just come in right here, just sort of save their breath for this very, very long passage here. Now, the tubas do not get that kind of a break. They are asked to just hammer away at this low G and this higher G. Now, these notes are actually two octaves apart, correct? Because this A is sounding down a ninth, which is G right here in the staff, and that is two octaves above this G, which is concert pitch. So the tenor tuba is really playing more in the horn register, and in fact, it really is compensating here. This is a beautiful idea. You have the first and second horn on top, doubling with, or quadrupling, with the fourth and fifth horn, same exact notes. And then on the bottom, just the third and fourth horns. But you know something? They are actually doubling the tenor tuba. So that is perfectly balanced right there. Of course, all of that is taken apart a little bit by the fact that you have the trumpets in octaves and the bottom note of both of these pairs of trumpets is actually the same note as the top note here, this off four horn unison. But then the bottom is balanced a little bit by the addition of the two tenor trombones. So that really fills in everything very, very beautifully, very beautifully balanced note. And of course, the trumpets will ring out very fiercely on top here. So you only really need uh, two trumpets, right? The first and the third trumpet playing those high Gs. And of course, there's so much pounding away at that high G pitch anyways. Uh, the second violins, as we said before, the uh, two oboes and the first clarinet. So that is enough force on that note to compensate for any mass of pitches on the lower Gs. And then, of course, we have both timpani players hammering away at two different timpani tuned to G. And of course the snare drum at the same time. So that is just a wonderfully, wonderfully balanced, wonderfully thought out octave unison tutti. From this point on, what you'll notice is with the exception of a couple of spots, Hulse is basically just going to recap a lot of the material that happened before, but change it around in different ways to make it continue to be interesting and remind you of what's happened before, but add enough twists to it so it doesn't just seem like a repeat. The rhythm is just going to be carried by triple F trumpets, the uh, first and second, and first timpanist and snare drum. And that is enough to carry that through and the savagery of all the other notes playing in unison is going to continue that energy that we had before. Now this falls like a hammer blow. It's just the most intense, intense sound. Let's look a little bit at the way that it's scored without going into huge detail about everything, but just from the very start to see how much force and how much energy is being put on the lower and middle register of the orchestra. Now notice, most of the upper winds are not being used at all. So oboes, flutes, piccolo, they can take a break. Third and fourth trumpet, same deal. They could have actually continued to play along with the first and second trumpet, but it's not really needed. So let's go straight to the strings, like before. Low Gs being played by both sets of violins, so you've got 30 to 40 players just hitting this low G, and it's just going to be very fierce. Open G on the fourth string, the most resonant and gruffest string of the violin, and also being played along with the violas. It doesn't quite have the same power as the G of the violins, but it's still pretty ferocious when it's pushed. And then, of course, low open G for the cello and low G for the double bass. So, you know, pretty ferocious writing already before we even add anything else. Now, these Gs are being doubled by English horn, remember, because it transposes down a fifth, and by bass oboe, transposing down an octave. So you have these two lower double reeds playing in unison. And they are also joined by A3 clarinets and 
uh, six horns. So that is just the most massive sound. And you know what? I even didn't mention both tenor trombones. So the force of this melody is really on that massive G below middle C. Of course, that doesn't mean that there aren't other parts that are doubled at the octave below. Bassoons an octave below that, being doubled by bass trombone, and of course the cellos. And then <laughs> we've got the contrabassoon, and that is doubling the bass tuba. Now I, of course, forgot to mention that the tenor tuba is also doubling this low G, this low concert G. So really just a massive, massive sound. Now, as the melody climbs, Holst gets into some compensating, spreading some of the doubling around into octaves in the bassoons, in the horns, playing, building on this same octave. So, I, you know, playing an octave higher, technically. And there is some more of that compensating going on here. Now, as the melody starts to climb in the bassoons here, you'll notice that the higher instruments reach down. Instead of just going their merry way up to a higher concert A flat, written E flat, same with the clarinets, same with the horns and the strings. And you actually feel that drop as the upper edge of this octave unison jumps down to meet with the lower edge of the octave unison coming up. And at that moment, Holst gets into harmonizing. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful effect because it sort of brings the lines together in this really powerful way. And then they really start to climb on the next page where we see that most of the harmony is given to the clarinets and the horns. It's just really awesome once it gets to this point here and plays this beautifully bleak, terrifying chord. Once again, a form of D flat major over G. And just a lovely, lovely idea to have the tenor tuba coming in and catching the octave below the third and fourth trumpet. Yeah, so this is down a ninth, right? So this is playing that same low G that the melody started on all those measures back on the last page. I would just point out quickly to our multiple horn mavens out there or people who want to learn more about scoring for more than just four horns, the way that this chord is structured here. You have a unison by both middle horns, then you are spreading the rest of the sounding D flat major written A flat major chord out by having the mediant on the bottom, the major third on the bottom. Then you have the fifth on the lowest note of the second group. Then we have the tonic in the middle, which is underlined by the doubling. Then we have the mediant above right here, and then the fifth above that. That is a really wonderfully effective chord. One other thing that I want to point out here is the doubling of oboe and horn once again. I've been talking about this a little bit throughout this series, and I mentioned it, of course, in The Rite of Spring, just how wonderfully effective and warm that combination was. Of course, when you add trumpet to it, it becomes very golden in sound. So you have the roundness of doubled oboes plus horns, doubled horns even, then you have the sort of golden combination of trumpet plus horn. So you put it all together and it just really has this beautiful, massive, rich sound. This is all pretty interesting because as far as reusing material is going, Holst is really going right back to the source. Pretty much everything that has happened up to here is harmonically the same it's all sort of sitting in the same place. It hasn't been transposed up or down. It's just riding on that low G and trotting along very well. 
And as we go into this next part here, this is the same as before, except that there isn't any little ending commentary in the trombones like we had before, and then a pause of a bar. You'll notice this if you look back in your own score yourself. No, what Hulse does is he just lets both of those bars go by, and then he starts right back in with the tenor trombones, as written before, with some support from the bass tuba, and things build up nicely. And they really seem like they're going to completely recap what happened before and have that nice push into the next build up. But instead, what Holst does is he does his little ride down. Do you remember that? How he was going down a whole step, but changing harmonic context. In this case, it's a simple G major, interestingly written as D major, right, in our horns. So he's going here from D flat major to G major. Just a really wonderful shift because we were thinking before that if we were going to do this again, possibly, in our ear, the memory of what happened before, we might be anticipating that it would be down a whole step but changing harmonic context. But here it is really just the melodic step going down a whole step, but the root of the chord actually being G major. So instead of going from D flat to B, we're going from D flat to G. And that reinforces the pedal tone of G, which comes right back in very fiercely. Right? We were already at triple F, and now we're getting a big push into this. So the strings are just very fiercely pounding away at the rhythm once again, accompanied by the timpani and the snare drum, which are still going, and the little roll to push them into it. Very, very cool idea. But what's the neatest thing here is this really programmatic idea by all three trombones. Now, what's really great about this is it shows so much how the trombones can stand on their own in this kind of a unison. They just, this just really pulls it out. You can just imagine this being a cinematic moment in a queue, right? Almost um, as if people are shooting or people are marching along to some crazy beat to their doom or something like that. But it just really has this brilliant military quality that kind of cuts off all of this romantic illusions. It's almost like here everybody is kind of going off to their doom and they're having all these illusions of how they're going to be heroes and everything else, but they get brought up short by this change back to G and the trombones blasting along with bump, bump, ba da 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 Notice the context of major and minor is rather ambiguous because we have a major third coming off of the D flat major chord into the major third of B. However, uh, we get a little bit of a blue note here, right? So it is actually a minor third. Da 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 And then the same basic chord again. There are a few little differences from place to place. I could break down some of these chords for you, but I might do a separate video of 2T chords just for fun once I get through with this series. <clears throat> no promises, but it would be fun to do. So let's listen to all of that. I've let this overlap a little bit just because I wanted you to see how this wraps up. So I'm not going to mention the rest of this bar, but think of all those things. Think of how this just, just really savagely cuts off all the illusions that are building up here with the brutal military realities. Think about how this is similar to what happened before, but the pacing is different because of missing some bars, missing some preparatory material in the trombones, and just going straight into this. Think of the beautiful way this is harmonized, very different from the beginning. And then on the previous page, listen for those really amazing octave unisons and how they all work together with the way that I explained it. And then we'll go back, then we'll come back and pick it up right where this leaves off.
So now that we see how that all fits together, let's take a look at what's happening here. As I mentioned before, this last part is really a section of recaps, but it's changing harmonic context in places, generally speaking, taking things down a fourth. And that way it sets it up for a grand finale with a C root at the end of the piece. But we'll get to that in one or two more of these segments. For now, though, let's just look at the way that the tenor tuba is set up to play, instead of from a written E sounding D, we've got a written A sounding G, same pitch as this pedaled rhythm. And we have the same little imitation game happening here. They do their deadly game of row, row, row your boat. And it's set up very, very similar. But instead of leaping up to a chord here that pushes to a different change, the music just kind of hangs on this for a while and then adds some material that happened a little bit after figure two. Now, once again, the context has changed. This is, instead of sounding D flat major, it's sounding A flat major. So like I said before, down a fourth, even though this is down a fifth from its original statement. I really love the way that Hulse just throws this in just as a fragment. I feel that this is influenced possibly more by Stravinsky than by Schoenberg. Just to have a, a bit of the music just jump in there without any purpose other than to contrast the mood of what's happening while maintaining the same energy. The tenor tuba and trumpets continue their game for another bar, and then once again, this comes back in. Now before, this original idea was stated simply by the horns, but here we've added a whole layer of double reeds and single reeds to it. So essentially, this is really just the same pitches being played by both groups of instruments. One thing that's kind of neat about bass oboe and bass clarinet is when they're playing the same exact line, it's just really obvious. You can tell they're a whole step apart, in this case F here, and the actual pitch of E flat here, and then of course both of them sounding down an octave or down a ninth. And then this E flat is the same as this B flat here. The interesting thing about transposing between clarinet and English horn is that they are apart by a fourth rather than a fifth, right? The actual pitch here is A flat for both instruments. And then, of course, this is the same thing as the first two clarinets, first two oboes, and it has this wonderful sound, a sort of a, almost has a string-like edge to it, this wonderful combination of the double reeds and the single reeds above the horns. It's just a lovely, lovely voicing. And there is not one note left out. This is really Rimsky-Korsakov, late romantic type scoring, really. Because this is, you know, A-flat, C, E-flat. And then that top E-flat being the same E-flat as this. And then another triad built on top of that. It's a really, really wonderful way to handle these parallel harmonies. Though you wouldn't want to do it too much because then people would immediately know that you were stealing from Hull. So you'd want to add something to it or change the context in your own way rather than just ripping it off, you know, note for note. After the second iteration of this little fragment, Holst decides to continue on with the idea exactly the way that he did it before, except that he's going to continue on with the accompaniment of the winds and bolster it up even a little bit more with triads in the bassoons, with the flutes playing A2 and filling in the top of the triad of the oboes as well, and then the lower oboe family instruments taking lower positions. In this case, A sounding D, and this G here sounding an octave lower, G below, which is the same note as the third bassoon, right? Rather than the first bassoon. Really, really wonderful use of mixing up the different positions compared to what was happening before. 
Holst is keeping things interesting, keeping things integrated, rather than just relying on the same strategy, the same formula all the way through. The first trumpet comes in to double the main melody from below by an octave. And that is really enough right in there just to hold everything together. Of course, don't forget that the third and sixth horns are also playing that melodic note an octave lower along with the first bassoon, right? So it all has just this wonderfully scored structure of the winds and the horns and first trumpet working together. Let's just listen to that. I'll pick it up from right here at the beginning of the page so there's no confusion about score reading. And we will just take it through there, listen to the just this wonderful idea once again, of the trombones just really making a military point there that, you know, life is tough, it's not fair, and war is hell, right? <laughs> uh, that's what I get there. And then the tenor tuba and atu soli trumpets playing this little game of back and forth. And then the little fragment coming in, very similar to what happened before, but adding winds. Listen to the way those winds play above the horns. And also listen to this wonderful structure here, uh, the way that this is all scored together. And of course, with the very, very savage strings, once again, just hammering away at those low Gs. And then we will move on to the next section. If you're feeling a sense of deja vu by the time you get to the beginning of this page, then you are correct. It's not just a psychological illusion. In fact, you are really reading exactly the same pitches for almost every instrument on this page that happened before in the section leading up to figure three. This really is just the same notes in every instrument, except for the fact that before figure three, the pedal tone of trumpets and lower strings and so on were really hammering away at a C. Here, they're hammering away at a G. So, once again, Holst is keeping some elements down a fourth while leaving other elements right where they were before. So, the relationship is different, but the music is generally the same. So I'm not going to go over this whole thing again and belabor it. I mean, all of the lessons for the first half of this screen are really there in the first lecture on Mars, the bringer of war. And really going on here, this second half of the screen is the same thing that happened right after that, except also down a fourth. And the way that that's accomplished is Previously, we had this A-flat shifting down to an F-sharp, and that F-sharp was the dominant of a B major chord. Here, it is the tonic of an F-sharp major chord. So that is what's happening here. So F-sharp major being down a fourth from B major. Everything is pretty much structured like that. And instead of going F, G here, we're going C to D. So, really, Holst is reusing a lot of material. Of course, there are a few changes. We've got the piccolos on top where we didn't have them before. The pitches are higher here and there in some of the brass, which makes it even more exciting. And then this push here to the massive tutti that is about to happen is really just reusing some of those elements, but just making sure that they're set up a little bit better. So there, you know, there isn't a whole lot new on this page, but I just wanted to point out those few little changes, mostly having to do with harmonic context than anything else. So let's have a quick listen to that, and then we'll go on to the very last screen of this lecture, which has got some monumental scoring on it. So 
here, the build from the previous page culminates in this massive chord here. What I think is interesting about analyzing this chord is what it leaves out as much as what it puts in. For instance, there's really no need to include strings at all because nobody's going to hear them once you throw in this organ with all its stops out and the trumpets playing quadruple forte. Really, there's just no room in there. And the same thing is happening here. Piccolo, flute, an octave apart on that high G up there. A flat and D flat by the English horn. A flat, an octave below that. Now, something you're going to notice about this chord is that it's a very simple combination of a C fifth and an A flat fourth. Right, so it's almost like C flat against D flat. Uh, that is a chord I feel once again is influenced more by Stravinsky than it is by Schoenberg. It's really the Petrushka chord with the mediant taken out. There's no major third in there, but it's just basically C and G against D flat and A, or A flat and D, depending on how it's voiced. Really, combination of octaves or fifths or even just C's on the bottom, G's on the top, and then the dissonant notes voiced without really like a low D flat root. It's really like an A flat fourth above it. And that allows for the most resonant voicing of this possible. Really, if you look at these G trumpets here and the same G's in the organ, and then the A flat fourths in the third and fourth trumpets, and tenor trombones, also being doubled by the organ. And the sort of very organ-like sound of these clarinets above here, it all locks together just beautifully. Let's not forget, too, that the tenor tuba is also hammering on this same G right here. And then, of course, bass tuba is playing a very, very low C, an octave above the double basses and contrabassoons pretty much the same C as the A3 bassoons. I love how the chord resolves, meno F here, so not as loud, into quadruple forte strings that are being doubled by the winds, and there are no brass in there at all, not even the horns. And it has this wonderful feeling of release. I mean, it's releasing into a chord which isn't really a cadence that we're used to hearing because it just goes right back into the same exact harmony but scored a little bit differently. In this case we've got octave C's in the cellos and double basses which are played by the bass clarinet, bassoon and contrabassoon, leaving the violas and divisi second violins to play that A flat fourth, which is also taken up here by the English horn and the second oboe, and then adding the A flat above here, and then the G octave on top with the top part of the Divisi second violins and the first violins being doubled here by the A2 flutes and the second and third clarinet. Even though it followed such a scorching chord, it really just has this wonderful richness and soul to it. <laughs> no matter how macabre the effect might be, you know, if you're looking at a uh, at a corpse-strewn field after the bomb goes off or something like that, whatever it's supposed to uh, evoke in the listener's mind. And once again, what I feel is so wonderful about this is that this music taps common emotions, common feelings about certain things, but leaves the mental imagery to you, right? So that makes it the perfect kind of cinematic music. Music which is less specific about exactly what it is showing. Music that doesn't necessarily monkey around with hit points or anything like that, but generally expresses very, very deep emotions, very concentrated states of mind. And that makes it all the more convincing. 
so much easier to listen to this again and again and let images flash through your mind than to listen to the average film soundtrack and not be locked into the scenes that you saw from that film, even with John Williams, who I think is really a great composer and a, a great synthesizer of different styles. But you know, even at that, you know, music that has non-specific emotional focus, I think is possibly the best kind of cinematic or dramatic music of all. Now, this whole passage here of tensions and releases, tensions and releases, goes down into this wonderfully murky chord here. I mean, if the only thing you took away from here was how this chord was scored, how this wonderful harmony and timbre was achieved, then I would say it was worth your time. If we look at it, it's actually scored quite simply. There isn't anything going on in the horns that isn't going on in the strings. If your transposition reading is still trying to catch up, just look down here at the violins and the viola. It is all written right in there. G, D flat, A flat. Resolving to a simple D flat major chord over F. And I love the way that the bassoons and bass clarinet add to the quality of the tone here as well. This just would not sound the same without that bass clarinet, even though it is really rather surrounded by the bassoons and horns. It really does just have that wonderful quality to it. It wasn't just added for tone weight here. It really does have a purpose. And then just the very, very final comment is an extremely stripped down version of this chord. It's pretty much the same exact pitches if you just work that out. It's that same G, that's that same G of the first violins, concert G, uh, transposing of this D. But what a devastating effect that it has, just really, you know, like no hope left. If you let war win, you know, if, if everything is about war and not about achieving something and, and going forwards, then this is the kind of chaos. It's like, you know, the problem with just pure forward demanding energy where everything is a fight, you know, it, it tends to just leave everything destroyed. If there are no compromises, there's no consideration, there's no compassion, the end is just to kill as many or destroy as much of the opposition as possible. This is just really what you end up with, this kind of scorched earth that I think is part of what Hulse was trying to express here. Now, as you probably noticed, and I'm leaving to the last to mention, the time signature changed once again from 5-4 to 5-2, and it's just an easy way to slow the music down to half speed without having to deal with too much ambiguity, you know, like retard or menomoso or anything like that. He just cuts the speed in half, and it's exactly the kind of slower speed that he needs, slower tempo. Even with this very fast version that we've been listening to by the Canadian National Youth Orchestra, still, it really has an effective emotional contour to it. And quite often, conductors will slow it down even a bit more to just really get the most out of the emotion of that moment. And of course, you know, the hall might have something to do with it and, and a number of other factors that may change the tempo of the music. And then we have one last da da, right? Going from D flat major to B major. That same exact transition that we heard right near the beginning of the piece. However, the time signature goes to 3 4, making it much, much easier to count for the players. And they go into those staccato flurries with the winds coming in later on. And I feel it's a little bit more integrated here in terms of the scoring. The <clears throat> strings are very slowly moving up by thirds, right? D sharp, and it plays the pattern. Then F sharp, and plays the pattern. A, it plays the pattern. And then things sort of gradually zigzag their way down and then leap up to the top. And here, 
the wind playing is a little bit more integrated into what the strings are doing rather than leaving too many gaps. But those gaps are important because they keep the player's part a little simpler. Like if the bass oboist can leave out a few notes here and there, it's kind of a beast of an instrument to play. And Holst's scoring for this is quite adventurous, really, for most bass oboe players who are just picking up the instrument every once in a while and don't really have that good of an instrument to play with anyways. You know, the instrument usually is played so little that it's a bit out of shape. The pads might be not really closing quite right. A lot of notes might be a little bit off with their intonation. So, you know, it's, it's not the easiest instrument, but it's still a very, very cool part for a good player on a good instrument. Nevertheless, Holst leaves a bit of breathing space here and there, also with the clarinets. So things come to this big flurry. Now, I've talked about this before in this lecture, and that is that Holst is once again playing a trick on your ears. He is giving you the feeling that the entire orchestra is ending on this earth-shattering tutti right at the end. But it really isn't an earth-shattering tutti. It really is just the heavy brass and then the strings joining it. But man, because of the way that he sets up your expectations here, and because of the overwhelming overtones of quadruple forte heavy brass being played so fiercely, it fills in your imagination of thinking that the winds are playing this. And in fact, they are going right up to where the overtones sit for these chords, right? <laughs> Just, you know, simple octaves for the most part, octave Gs and... It, it, but you still just feel that sound. Same thing with the strings. You know, you, you feel that combined string and wind tone. Even though the strings come in later, it sort of economizes. If the audience thinks that the strings are playing high notes there, then, you know, let them continue to think that. And then you can use the actual strings to fill in some of these middle notes here. Of course, playing on their heaviest strings, right? This D flat would have to be played on the G string. This A flat to G double stop would have to be on the lowest two strings and so on, just going across the instruments. And don't forget this one cool little chord here, this B major chord. Remember, we shifted down to B major here. So this builds just beautifully, inexorably, along with the rolled timpani and the rolled tam-tam. And you put them together, and you have a conductor who really, really understands how to balance the energy of a passage like this. And you hear those six horns just flare out with this enormous power, which doesn't really translate here, right? You don't really see it unless you are a conductor who's worked with the score before or just has a, has a good eye. You see all this energy building in these rolled timpani parts, and then, of course, just naturally building up to, you would think, also quadruple F, in all parts by the time they hit this downbeat at figure 12. And you can see that is really why there are two rehearsal marks here, because Holtz just knew that this was going to take a bit of time to woodshed. It's hard enough for all of these flurries to just hit dead on, which they really have to for this to be effective. And yet, it's not just that, it's also just really nailing the balance here to try to get the horns to really play out so that they just allow this to smash here. The audience is just feeling that it has to culminate in something, anything. And then you get to this really, really beautifully scored passage. Notice C and low G. So this low G is really just adding a bit of force. Its pitch is really not going to be distinguished at all. Really, it's, it's almost just become a bass drum at this point. The real context of the pitch is going to be dominated by the second timpani player writing this C here. And then, of course, you know, if we just pick this apart, it's actually pretty obvious, you know, because these are all C instruments, shouldn't be too hard to work out. You know, you've got that same G being doubled on top, and then the A flat and the D flat being played by both the trumpets and then an octave lower by the trombones. And... The one instrument that is not a concert C is the tenor tuba, which of course is playing a G, which you should probably recognize by now. <clears throat> and that really just dominates the middle range to the high, 
leaves this beautiful gap in the middle, which we're going to fill in a second. Then low C on the bass tuba, and of course we just talked about the timpani already. <clears throat> then we just add these strings to this big hole in the middle here, which you would think should be filled by horns. Nope. Holst wants to fill them with the strings, and it just really, you know, focusing that much tone right there in the middle with the strings and at the bottom really does work. Works very, very beautifully. One last thing that I'll point out is that this ending, once again, is a fragmentation of the original da 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 dun 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 right, We have da 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 dun missing beat, bum bum bum. But of course, slowing down, you know, it's going to sound very dramatic. Dun 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 dun. Dun dun dun. And then this is backwards, dun dun dun, da 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 dun. But of course played much, much slower. And then two beats, three beats. So there is a mathematics to this. It isn't just random. Those aren't just put in there, you know, just to sound dramatic and savage and and hopeless and everything else. Holst really did work out relationships, rhythmic relationships, and they work really great because they're playing on your instincts and what you have heard before. And then he ends with this beautiful, low, massive note. C-fifths being played just on open strings, low C if the double bassist has got them, which usually they do nowadays, and the lowest two open strings of the violas as well, low Gs by the violins. It's almost as if this whole thing was designed to end with the most fierce, loud, savage, low notes of all the strings possible, so that at least they would have some chance of competing against quadruple forte heavy brass playing those same notes. So these are going to be kind of cranky low Gs, but, you know, I'd, they can be excellent notes, but they're getting down into the kind of cranky colorless range of the lower part of the trumpets. But yeah, they, they'll still sound fine, especially quadrupled like this. And then, of course, we've got C on the bottom there with the tenor trombones. And then just filling in a G for the bass trombone, kind of unusually, really. And this is also going to be that same low C as these tenor trombones. Isn't it interesting how the tenor clef seems to have the same basic written notes as the tenor tuba transposing down a ninth, right? That's kind of an interesting little coincidence. And then, of course bass tube on the bottom, and these same rolled pitches. And let's not forget the A3 bassoons and contrabassoon. Beautifully done. This really would have torn out the audience's heart listening to it, especially coming as it did. The premiere of this work was not really to happen in its full form until the war was just well over and done, but the memories of what had happened would still be very painfully fresh. And I feel that has something to do with the popularity of this work. Not a, a bland popularity of something that is just very customary and suitable for our audiences, nor was it sort of a fanboy type of popularity of like, oh, geez, this, uh, you know, this is sort of like our, you know, it appeals to our emotions as, you know, this really great new pop phenomenon. Well, there was a little bit of that at first. But I think because the emotions really played on a lot of what the British public and then the European and American public um, and eventually the rest of the world had gone through, that you know, and it wasn't just the war either. There are other aspects to the way that life was changing and to the way that our perception of things was becoming more heightened and more dramatic in a way that we could handle, you know, rather than just people kind of turning off. That all caught everything right at the same moment. And I, and I would actually somehow speculate that this work's approachability, yet extreme experimentation, 
probably helped other works that were more experimental on the face of it, like, say, The Rite of Spring, to get more of an audience. If these grandiosely scored works really were going to find a permanent place on the repertoire, I think this piece really helped to raise all boats. So anyway, that's all I've got to say about Mars. Um, I really, really love this piece, and I've sort of been humming it all week as I have been creating this lecture for you. And now I can go on to Humming Venus, because that is coming up in the next two lectures. So let's listen to this page, and then I will leave it until then, which should be coming along in a few days for the Patreon crowd, a couple of weeks for the YouTube viewers. Think about all the things that we talked about, the way that this is structured, just all heavy brass, the way that the overtones suggest winds playing on top that would be sort of drowned out anyways. Think about how the strings are filling in the middle and lower range there. Think about these flurries and how the horns push behind them along with the rolled percussion. And think about how all these chords are put together. And here's one place, like I mentioned a few lectures ago, you're really going to hear the organ stand out. And especially here, I would say. Here, the force of the heavy brass is going to drown it out a little bit or blend with it almost seamlessly. But when you get to here, it's still going to enrich the strings here in a way that has it stand out a little bit. But it doesn't last for very long. But also listen to the way that the, the energy relaxes throughout these different chord changes. Really the same chord just relinquishing into a more relaxed resolution, though no kind of cadence as anybody would have experienced up to that point. All right, enjoy that, have a listen to it, and I will see you in the next lecture.